All right, so uh, Heidegger is coming from a culturally conservative background. He is associated <coughs> with intellects like Spengler, uh, intellectuals rather like Spengler and, say, uh, Vandenbroek, uh, who are also working that territory. Is there any evidence in the 20s that Heidegger is uh, particularly aware of the National Socialist Movement, which is, of course, rising through the 1920s, or has connections in particular there? Yeah, uh, I think what's interesting about Heidegger and, that, and those kinds of connections is that um, he was he was a, 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 a so so out to front comrade. You know, he'd been in the First World War, but he never saw combat. But the people who came out of that war, like Ernst Junger, and wrote books like Stahlgewitter, Storm yeah, of Steel, Storm of Steel. That's the called. English title, right? Yeah. And uh, th there were there were two kinds of people that came out of, or, you know, as far as writers of books that came out of the World War One experience. You had people like Ernst Junger who glorified war, glorified the bonding that went on among men facing death and uh, the, the existential idea of your facing death together. And then there were people like Eric Maria Remarque and Jewish writers who were extremely anti-war, sure. who wrote All Quiet on the Western Front. And uh, it's interesting to see both of these things played out, pl being played out. And, and the other thing is, is this, the, this element of anti-Semitism, in part, as Reiner Martin made a comment in my film, is really a, a anti-cosmopolitanism. Mm. Uh, Heidegger believed that uh, this rootlessness of thought, people who are not rooted in the soil or in the land or in an area or a region, uh, cannot really be authentic. Mm. Uh, and he, for example, he uses the term as early as 1916, folks Gemeinschaft. Now, this idea of the people's um, community mm -hmm. is in German very carries a lot of heavy load. It's uh, as opposed to how we would translate it. It meant the folk being blut und Boden, you know, the blood and soil right. of a people growing in the same area, but also of the same blood. Uh, it was certainly not multiculti or anything like that. And these strong feelings uh, meant that. The people in the city, there's a great story, if I can just digress. Um, Heidegger was offered the chair in philosophy, the Hegel chair in philosophy at Berlin. Right. And he turned it down. And he turned it down. And I mean, that is the highest honor in philosophy. I mean, mm. Hegel, the German philosopher, <laughs> and he turns it down. And the story is, and, and supposedly it's true, it sounds too good to be true, is that he was in his little hut in, Mes, uh, in, in Totenauberg, and he went to the local farm woman, the, the, the farmer's wife, and he, he loved the bower, the farmers, the peasants that lived in that area. And he says, what do you think? Should I go to Berlin? And she just nods her head. And so he writes his letter. Didn't, <laughs> you know, so I, yeah. he, had, he had this unbelievable romanticizing of, of people who worked the soil. Mm -hmm. And as Reiner Martin says, uh, he never really got over uh, the uh, transition from a rural agricultural society to an industrial cosmopolitan one. Well, certainly, uh, in his uh, post World War II writings, that comes through. Very yeah, clearly. and then yes. of course, cosmopolitanism is a buzzword for anti Semitism because the Jews, the yeah. eternally wandering Jew, they end up in city centers, they end up in finance, they end up in law, they end up in, f in professorships. Sure. And uh, frankly, that's a cosmopolitan community, both in banking and right, academics. Yes. Right, and and uh, Heidegger was a farm boy, mm -hmm. and frankly, I think he was intimidated mm -hmm. and uh, couldn't stand competition. Mm -hmm. And he'd have to, he'd have to, you know, you have to speak up when you when, uh, especially among Jewish intellectuals, because they they uh, they come out of a tradition of reading the Talmud and discussing and arguing. And uh, they're, they're, there's, they're challenging at all times. Sure. Heidegger would profess an idea that he thought was uh, profound, and he just expected people to accept it for mm -hmm. that. You know. Okay. Let's uh, fast forward a bit then to 1932, 1933. Clearly, the Nazi movement is uh, in its ascendancy, and it comes to power right in 1933. Uh, and then, uh, how does this change Heidegger and galvanize uh, him, so to speak, uh, politically? Well, it, it's really quite fascinating because Heidegger had so many students that were Jewish. Herbert Marcuse, Hannah Arendt, Karl Lurwitz, Hans 
Jonas. Um, and he was a he was a uh, studied under Husserl, who was the father of phenomenology, and Husserl was Jewish, and he knew Karl Jaspers, and Jaspers' wife was Jewish, and so he uh, and he even had this thing about dark-haired, brown-eyed Jewish women. I mean, mm. it, I spoke with his son. I know this is a digression, but I spoke with his son, and he told me, Herman said, that his, he knew that his father had at least 12 affairs, and uh, many of them, or several of them, were Jewish students. Mm. The, the, the three Gretchen in Marburg, and then uh, Elizabeth Blockmann, uh, and others. But So you had this, this seemingly contradiction. When he becomes rector, of German, the first, the rector in Germany of Freiburg University, he openly joins the pub, the Nazi Party. Uh, and then he enthusiastically goes along with the Gleichschaltung, which means the the bringing of the university in line with Nazi thought. And uh, many of the people I interviewed said, "Look, it, it it couldn't have been that he, within a week or so, became a Nazi." Uh, there are many things that led up to his. By 1931, he was reading the Volkische Beobachter. He was uh, a well aware of Nazi thought, and much of what he thought about Nazism, he was in agreement with. Mm. Now, he's he's quoted because he was wanted to be the leader of the leader. Uh, he thought that Nazism or the National Socialism was too important to just hand over to these crude Nazis, mm. you know. Uh, but of course, they used him, and by the time the the average Nazi didn't have a clue about philosophy, and so they they didn't know who he was. I mean, in terms of how important he was to their movement, they just used him, and then they said, "Well, he, he, we don't understand what the hell he's talking about," mm -hmm. and uh, so he. Uh, but he he wanted to become. Um, um, a major leader in the academic circles. He went uh, to a conference in Leipzig, I think it was, and uh, of university professors and university leaders. Does it still be a 33? Uh, this would have been later. This would have been a little bit later, but s around the 33 area. Okay. Yeah. Heidegger's uh, officially becoming a Nazi uh, in 1933. Yeah. And his ambitions there and how he was used or not by the Nazis. Yeah. It was both. Yeah. Yeah. It was both. Uh, but he, uh, uh, again, he believed that in, in, in the uh, certain essential aspects of National Socialism that were the hope for uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. And to keep it in context, um, fascism in the 20s and 30s didn't have the pejorative. Right, definitely, right. Uh, in fact, many people, young people, political leaders, etc., believed that fascism was the way to go to counteract Bolshevism, communism on the one side, and mad dog capitalism and American modernity on the other. And uh, if you look at it in that context, you, you know, it, it was very attractive for a lot of people. Um, and, uh, but there's still, there was still this element of anti-Semitism, which is uh, not to be. All right, so after coming to power in the 30s, the Nazis then go a long way to implementing their program. World War II breaks out. Uh, they end up losing that war. News about the Holocaust uh, right, emerges. Uh, let's turn to Heidegger's reactions or, or, or his inactions, right, so to speak, after World War II. He lived until 1976, right, I believe, so he lives another 31 years. Um, and one of the interesting issues here is that he never recants right on his uh, national socialism, uh, never says anything about the Holocaust and so forth. Uh, why do you think that was? It's interesting. I've thought about this for a long time, and the only way that it makes sense for me to try to understand this is my wife, uh, who was a clinical psychologist uh, and uh, did a lot of therapy for many, many years. She said he was a narcissist, and there's no doubt that he was a narcissist, and that narcissists cannot see themselves, e even if it's shown to them right in front of their faces, the narcissist cannot see themselves as being wrong. It's just not in their picture build. Mm. On the other hand, what's interesting about Heidegger is, 
I mean, you take somebody like um, Hans Georg Gadamer. You know, he at a time was an enthusiastic Nazi, mm-hmm. and but what Gadamer did was he took all of his writings that he wrote during the Nazi period and pulled them out of circulation and rewrote them and re-changed them. And many of those things he published later, after the war, became major works of Gadamer, okay? Heidegger refused to do that. He and, and he was sort of, sort of a stubborn kind of, of I don't want to say honesty, but he, he left all of that stuff in, you know, that he thought that n- National Socialism was a, the last hope. And uh, you're giving a, kind of a psychological interpretation that he as a narcissist yeah. uh, can't admit that he's wrong right, yeah. and so forth. Um, what about a, an intellectual interpretation, which would be to say that he still believes that the philosophy, or his philosophy is correct, uh, or that his political philosophy is correct, uh, at least in principle, um, and so he doesn't see the need to change anything. That's right. Yeah. And that that is also true. But then there would still be an issue of his particular connections to Hitler and the Nazis and the issues of the Holocaust, if he wants to preserve the philosophy as a theory, he would at least be making some distancing, saying that the Nazis perverted it or they didn't carry out the program correctly, but he didn't do any of that either. No. Uh, it, it's, it, it is uh, a mind-boggling issue in many respects. Herbert Marcuse wrote him a letter saying, pleading, look, just step back, make an apology, point out that you were wrong here and here and here, that it was wrong to lead young men to Nazism. And Heidegger refused to do so, and I think in part because he didn't think it was wrong. Mm. Hermann Heidegger, yeah. who's the son of his father being Martin Heidegger, right. and he makes a quote that's not in my film because I was not allowed to use it, in which his father said to him, my ideas and my philosophy the Germans are not yet ready for it, mm. maybe in another hundred years. Mm. And there are some very r- conservative, nationalistic, right-wing, if you want to use that term, German thinkers, cultural thinkers uh, today that just worship Heidegger and think in those same terms, that the time's not yet right for this great philosophical truth to find its fruition in Germany. Now, the thing about it is, is it's still highly nationalistic. It's German. Mm. If you talk to Heidegger scholars like Ted Kissel and others, um, there are elements of Heidegger that are being used by scholars in Japan, in Asia, in Russia, even in in other parts of the world who um, take Heideggerian insights and apply it to their own language. Uh, So... The, there, the, there is something in Heidegger that, that is fascinating and is of value. But Emmanuel Fay, on the other hand, really m- makes a case, and most academics disagree with him, but he makes a case that m- Heidegger's writings are Nazi to the core. Mm. And uh, if you talk to a scholar like Ian Thompson at the University of New Mexico, he'll be first to say that you know Heidegger was a terrible person his, he made terrible mistakes. He was wrong about his Nazism, but yet there are certain ideas in Heidegger that we have to, we have to read him critically, mm-hmm. and there are certain things that are of value. and And the job is to separate the good from the bad, so to speak. Mm-hmm.